the purpose of this lecture is to give you some foundation. Bailey. The purpose of this lecture is to give you some foundation as regards to the DNA molecule, uh, molecular diversity, and how we look at that at a very, very fine level. For many of you, this will be review, or at least many of the concepts will be review. But I've learned not to take for granted that students coming into even these upper division courses know this material. So if it's new to you, great. Remember, if it's uh, something you need to be reminded of, spend a little bit of time with it. If it's just a reminder, so much the better, and you're, you're well prepared. So if we look at DNA, which of course is the molecule that contains all of the information for making life on Earth, it's the blueprint, if you will, for all living organisms. It's a very complex macromolecule. However, after looking at repeating patterns, it's a fairly simple uh, structure that we can break it down. We are going to begin with the sugar fast phosphate backbones, which are here along the sides. So this is a ball and stick model where gray represents carbon, uh, blue represents nitrogen, and then we have uh, yellow is phosphate and white is hydrogen, um, and yellow or red is oxygen. Now, for the sugar phosphate backbone, if you look closely, it's the same basic unit or monomer repeated over and over and over again. And although one strand goes in one direction and the other strand has the opposite orientation, they are repeated exactly the same one right after another. So there is no diversity. It's an important structural component of the molecule, but it's not where the diversity comes from. You can think of the DNA molecule like a rope ladder that's been twisted up along its longitudinal axis. And so the sides of the rope at ladder are the sugar phosphate um, repeated units. However, the rungs, if you will, the molecules that span across between the sides are nucleotides. That's a common name. Sometimes you'll hear people say DNA base pairs or um, nucleic acids, but nucleotides is, a, is the best term, and that's the term that we will be using. And although they are not hyperdiverse, they are more diverse than the backbone, and that's where all of the variability in DNA comes from. So as we look across, we notice that there are two types of molecules in general. There are molecules that have two rings. We call these purines. And then there are molecules that have a single ring. We call these pyrimidines. And a single ring molecule, pyrimidine, always matches with a double ringed molecule, a purine, on the other side. This one is thymine. This one is adenine. And that way, the molecular space between the two sides of the molecule are always the same because we have one, two, three molecules and one, or sorry, rings, one, two, three rings, and one, two, three rings here. And T can appear on either side. A can appear on either side. So there's no uh, constraint as to which side they appear on. However, they always need to be paired with a complementary uh, nucleic acid or nucleotide. Now, another important thing to recognize is that between the A and the T pairing, there are two hydrogen bonds. These little uh, dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds. Those, of course, are the weakest type of um, atomic bond, uh, and they serve to hold them together, but not very, very strongly. Between the C and the G nucleotides, there are three, again, hydrogen bonds. So weak, but a little bit stronger because there's an extra one. Now, we can represent these molecules with these line drawings, which you may be familiar with from organic chemistry. Uh, and they provide a little bit more detail than the ball and stick. We have some indication of what some of the molecules are, uh, indication where they're double bonds versus single covalent bonds. But for our purposes, this level of detail is not really necessary. I just wanted you to be aware of it, be aware of what uh, adenine and, and guanine are, that they fall into this category of purine that thymine and cytosine fall into the category of pyrimidine, and that A always pairs with T with two hydrogen bonds. C always pairs with G uh, with three hydrogen bonds. And in fact, from now on, we are only going to look at those abbreviations. We're going to use letters to represent these complex molecules. And then the order in which these letters occur is the diversity, the genetic diversity. And even though we only have four possible nucleotides, 
we can string those together in any order. So if we're looking at a string of DNA that is one nucleotide long, we have four different possibilities. If we are two nucleotide long, then we have 16, or 4 times 4. If we have three nucleotides long, then we have 64 different possible combinations, and so on. Every time we increase by a magnitude, timesing it by 4. So it is um, 4, 16, 64, 258, I think it is, close to, uh, a little bit over 1,000, and then so on down the line. And by the time we get 20 or 30 base pairs long, we have hundreds of millions of different possible combinations. So from this fairly simple, basic beginning part of diversity, we can create all sorts of diversity once we have these longer chains of our nucleotides together. Now, when we visualize DNA from now on, we are just going to use these letters to represent it. And not only that, we will only show you one of the strands. And by convention, if it's in a gene, we show you the sense strand, the strand that codes for um, a amino acid product. So here is the beginning of the human insulin gene. Genes begin with a start codon, ATG. This is the DNA version. If it was in the RNA version, you would see AUG. But we'll stick with DNA version because that's just by convention. Now, we don't show you the other strand, although there would be another strand that would complement this. And in fact, you would start on this end because it would go in the opposite direction. You could find the complement for each of these. So that it would be G, 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 T, C, A, and then so on, all the way back to the beginning till we had our double-stranded molecule. But that's redundant because A always pairs with T, T always pairs with A, G, and C. So there's no reason to show both molecules, So by convent or both strands of the molecule. By convention, we only show the one strand. And if it's in the gene, we'll show you the sent strand. Now, if it's in non-coding DNA, we only just we just pick a direction. And for instance, if we are looking at the sequence of an entire chromosome, then we would just pick one of the directions, show a single strand, and then we might make note of whether a gene occurs in this strand, the sent strand, or if it occurs in the other strand and its sense direction would then go the opposite way. Genes can occur in either strand, but just by convention, if we're showing a long piece of DNA, we only show the one single strand. Now, you should be familiar with these terms. The reading frame is the proper three-letter combination that we use to turn this nucleic acid sequence, the nucleotides, into an amino acid sequence or a protein. So ATG codes for methionine. And so this little chart here will help you to translate it. You don't really need to be able to do that, but it's helpful, and we'll probably use this at a, at a later time in the semester. So in this type of a diagram, the center of the bullseye represents the first position of the codon. The, outer, the middle ring here represents the second position, and the outer ring represents the third position. So to translate this, I would begin here A. T, G, that's methionine, and so we have an M. This M is the translation of those first three nucleotides. The next three, G, C, C, G, C, C is alanine, or abbreviated with an A. Now, just be aware that although A appears in both of these, this A represents the nucleotide adenine, A, D, and this represents alanine, AL. And although the, the words and the, the names for them are similar, they are very different molecules. Okay, so just be aware of that. We have only four nucleotides. However, there are 20 different possible amino acids. So we have 20 different letters representing the one letter abbreviation for each of those amino acids. And so every three nu nucleotides gets turned into one amino acid. And of course, that takes place through the process of transcription into RNA often splicing if it's a eukaryotic organism, and then finally translation using the proper reading frame to translate it into an amino acid. If you don't know the reading frame, you can't just go ahead and figure out what the amino acid is because if we start at the wrong place, so for instance, if we started at that T, TGG, TGG is tryptophan, and that is not the correct reading frame. It would be like reading an English sentence without reading it uh, in the proper, uh, with the proper spaces between the words. In the molecule, we don't have spaces, so we need to establish the reading frame. Stop codon is one of three possible codons that let the molecules know that that is the end of the gene. 
And of course, the start codon is ATG or methionine. But also be aware ATG can occur in the middle of a gene and just code for a methionine in the middle of a gene. I don't know that we have one here. Oh, there's one. Yeah, so there's one in the fifth position here in addition to uh, the first position. So methionine can occur in places other than just at the start. Okay, so that's how we visualize DNA. You'll be using a, pro a program called MEGA to get you a little bit more um, flexibility and to get you some a tool that you can use to download and analyze DNA sequences. Now we need to define the term gene. And this is one that, as a teacher, I took for granted, but I find that there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding about what exactly we mean by a gene. So very simply, a gene is a piece of DNA, a stretch of DNA, that is transcribed into RNA. And that's it. If it's transcribed into RNA, then we can classify it as a gene. So that's the process of transcription. Now, most genes are not done when they get to RNA. The RNA is just a temporary storage of that information that can then be transported to a ribosome. And then uh, the ribosome can translate it. And that's an overview, and it's rather simple in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, there's an additional step between transcription and translation where we have splicing and then sometimes some processing of the RNA into a mature mRNA that can then be translated. So we need to splice in eukaryotic genes, and then we translate it, and those are the protein-coding genes. The vast majority of genes are protein-coding, but there are some that are not. There are some that are only used in the RNA form, and those are still genes, although not protein-coding genes. So here is a diagram showing you a very kind of simplistic view of what a gene is. Now, the most common definition of gene, the one that we will be using in this class, includes the promoter, all of the exons and introns, and then, of course, the stop codon. And in addition, there is a 5' prime and a 3' prime UTR, or untranslated region. It's transcribed, but it's never translated in the protein coding. And those together, the promoter, and I don't have the 5' prime and 3' prime UTR listed here, but those, all of the introns and exons, that is the gene. Sometimes people, in a little bit more of a loose definition, also include regulatory elements as part of the gene, but technically they are not part of the gene. However, they do help to control the expression of the gene. And although that is not the topic of this class, we may come back to it just a little bit, and it's a really interesting and important part of diversity of organisms, it's not the focus of this class. We are going to be focusing on the DNA molecules where there's diversity, and in particular we'll be looking a lot at the coding regions of the DNA. But if a piece of DNA can bind to a, a regulatory, sorry, can bind to a transcription factor and increase the expression levels of the gene, increase transcription and translation, then it's called an enhancer. And the thing that binds to it is called an activator. If that piece of DNA will slow down or stop transcription of the gene, so we have very little of that protein product available, it binds to something we call a repressor. And so this silencer and repressor work together to turn off. And most of these are located fairly close to the gene uh, that they help to regulate. Okay, so be aware of what a gene is and what it uh, includes and what it doesn't include. Now, a lot of times uh, I have students coming into this class who do not understand the entire um, proportions that occur in most genes, particularly in eukaryotic genes. So here is a map of the human insulin gene, just as an example. And most genes are very similar, more or less, to this in eukaryotic organisms. So this is the entire gene. We have a 5' prime untranslated region, and then we have an intron. Introns can occur early in the, molecule, early in the gene or later. Uh, we then have this little green box that represents, so I don't have it labeled. That's exon number one right there. Intron 2, exon 2, intron 3, exon 3. And so what happens is this entire thing is transcribed, but then the introns are spliced out, and we are left with just the exons in the untranslated regions, and the exons are the only thing that is turned into the amino acids. The untranslated regions are often used to help move them about and localize them in the correct place so that they can be translated. So notice that proportionally the introns make up a much larger part of the gene than the exons. And it averages about 16 to 17 times as much intron DNA as there is exon DNA. So if we looked at only the genes themselves, we would still have about, you know, what is that, about 70, no, it's more than that, it's about 
let's see, 80% would be 80, 10. I'm trying to figure out the proportions in my head. Anyway, a majority of the DNA is non-coding introns. But even more so, if we zoom out a little bit, so here we are zooming out, and so this human insulin gene, this little arrow here, represents this entire span of the gene, all of the introns and the exons on the chromosome. And notice that there are wide spaces between the insulin gene and the other genes that are, closer to, that are closest to it. And in fact, about 75% of the chromosome is this space between the genes. And this is in the human genome. It varies a little bit from genome to genome, but it's roughly uh, similar for other eukaryotes. So about 75% of the, of the chromosomes are uh, space between the genes. It's sometimes called intragenomic space. About 25% more or less are uh, space uh, non-coding DNA within the genes, the introns, and that leaves a very small percentage, about one and a half percent, that is actually protein coding. When we add up all of these exons, it's only one and a half percent of the total of the human genome. And other eukaryotes, it's a little more, a little less, but the vast majority is non-coding DNA. Now, non-coding DNA does not mean it's not important, that it doesn't have an impact on the organisms. Some of that non-coding DNA is regulatory DNA, and that can have a very dramatic impact on phenotype. Some of it is structural DNA, like in centromeres or telomeres, that help to organize DNA replication or help to maintain integrity of the chromosomes over many, many cycles of replication. And those are important also. But much of the phenotype and the part that we'll be spending our most time on in this class is in this very small 1.5% of the genome that actually codes for those proteins. And proteins are the molecular machines, right? The mechanisms that effect change and uh, dynamic occurrences in living cells. Now, when DNA is copied, it is usually copied exactly the way it was originally found. However, it's not at 100% fidelity. Sometimes a mistake is made. And we'll look at rates of mistake and how we classify different types of mistakes and then how we determine whether or not they're going to have an impact on evolution. But that's the subject for another discussion. So I have given you a putative, right, an example sequence of DNA here. If when it was copied, a mistake was made and a guanine was substituted in place of an A, that is called a substitution mutation. It's a type of a point mutation because only one base pair was changed. That's how we define point mutation. And by far, the most common type of mutation that occurs during DNA replication is point mutations. Now, for sexually reproducing organisms, we're really only interested for evolution in the point mutations and other mutations that occur during meiosis. You might be interested individually in mutations that occur during mitosis because they may lead to cancer or some other uh, detrimental impact or maybe even a beneficial impact, but they're not important for us because they can't get passed on to the next generation. Only mutations that occur in the germline, which in sexually reproducing organisms is meiosis, only those are important for evolution. Now for prokaryotes and for the eukaryotes that only reproduce asexually, these same mistakes happen during mitosis. The process of DNA replication is roughly equivalent in both mitosis and meiosis. It's just that we have different areas we're focusing on if we're going to look at the evolution of a population. There's also a second type of a point mutation called an insertion deletion, or for short, indel. <coughs> and we treat them the same because they have the same impact, roughly the same impact, on the DNA. An insertion is where when we copy the DNA, we make a mistake, and there is an extra molecule, a guanine in this case, that is inserted. And of course, there'd be a corresponding adenine um, on the other side. I'm sorry, a uh, cytosine, right, would pair with guanine. There'd be a, a corresponding cytosine on the other side. But that's a mistake. Notice that this uh, sequence is one nucleotide shorter than this sequence. If we missed one when it was being copied, so here that C is missing, and this sequence is one shorter than the original sequence. So those are insertion deletion mutations. Now notice that if this occurs in the middle of a gene, it throws off the reading frame. Whereas before, we would translate this A, C, G, T, A, C, G, T, A, C, G, T, if that insertion wasn't there. Suddenly now we have G, C, C as the next codon, and then every codon after that 
is off by one base pair, and so it makes a change to everything downstream if an insertion occurs in a protein coding region. And likewise, if we miss one, then it throws off everything downstream also. So insertion deletions, especially if they occur in a coding sequence, can have a significant impact on the phenotype of an organism. There are larger types of mutations that can occur also. So let's explain, explain these briefly. Luckily, they're fairly intuitive. The names match uh, what's going on fairly easily, and they should be easy for you to remember. A duplication mutation is where a large piece of DNA gets copied twice. So here in this example, we have two genes that are accidentally copied twice, and we end up with a gene duplication event. A deletion is when we miss out on some genes. They are not copied at all, and so we end up with a chromosome that is missing some of the original material. Again, more than one base pair, it's termed a deletion event. Now, if unequal crossing over occurs during meiosis, uh, this can lead to both a duplication in one of the resulting chromosomes and a deletion in the other resulting chromosome. So unequal crossing over occurs when parts of chromosomes swap, but not fairly. And so we're missing material in one of the descendants and have extra material in the other one. And those are, are important and can have a major impact on phenotype. An inversion, just as the name implies, is where we have no additional DNA, no lost DNA, but part of the DNA is arranged in different order. It's inverted, uh, but in the same location. And then finally, a translocation is where a piece of DNA is moved to an entirely new chromosome or to a very different site on the same chromosome. Translocation. Now, this question at the bottom is a very difficult question to answer because it's a very complicated question. We're only going to talk about it very briefly here, but we'll go into it in more detail and the impact of this question on diversity and evolution in later chapters. So a mutation can have a wide range of phenotypes, and it can be very difficult to determine. It can range from everything to completely detrimental, even fatal, to neutral, that it's real, it's there, you can measure it, but it doesn't have any impact at all on, on phenotype, to very, very beneficial and everything in between. And to do this, we would need to know some more information. And if you've had the evolution class, you might have some ideas about the types of uh, features that are going to help us answer this question for any one individual mutation. But for now, don't worry about it. Just know that there's a wide range from complete, completely detrimental to neutral all the way through up to very, very beneficial. All of the diversity of life on Earth came originally from a random mutation, a mistake that was made during DNA replication. Now, I always have students say, oh, what about sexual reproduction? I had teachers who told me about all the diversity that's created during sexual reproduction, like random assortment or crossing over, both forms of genetic recombination. However, in order for us to have genetic recombination uh, through random assortment, sometimes called independent assortment, or through crossing over, we have to have some diversity. So here we have different chromosomes represented in red and blue. And if there were different genetic sequences on those, then we can end up with a wide range of different gametes that can make all sorts of combinations in the offspring. However, if these were identical, then no matter how we mixed and matched them, no matter how many times we swapped parts of chromosomes, as long as it was an even swap, we would not create anything new at the nucleotide level. Everything would be exactly the same, and all of these gametes would be identical. So even the great diversity generated by sexual reproduction would be impossible unless first there was some sort of a mutation to create that diversity. And so I picked just a few images to represent the grand diversity of life on Earth, the grandeur, as Darwin said. Everything from bryozoans to fungi, it's a, a devil's finger or octopus fungus, uh, to interesting plants, uh, other protozoans, uh, arthropods. This is an extinct bird but was a live, real uh, um, bird, not closely related to ostriches and emus, by the way, but uh, living on, uh, running on two legs and was a, a large predator. The fairy armadillo, really cute, looks like a Pokemon, but is, in, is indeed a real organism, and the giant sunfish, or mola mola. So anyway, I could have picked any other organism. I just want you to get a feel for that diversity. And it all originated somewhere anciently as a mutation. And as the mutations build up, and then natural selection and genetic drift work on those mutations, we get the great diversity of life on Earth. Now, we are going to be looking at uh, DNA, and you'll be looking in coming days at a program software called MEGA, and we'll be doing some exercises and uh, projects worksheets with, those, um, with that program. So you'll get a little bit familiar with it in a, in a future lecture.
But I want you to just kind of get an eye for this. So I've taken the human insulin molecule and I have also downloaded the same gene for other organisms. So Gorilla Gorilla, this is, by the way, one of the best scientific names for an organism. The generic name, the genus, is Gorilla. The specific name or species is Gorilla. And, of course, the common name is Gorilla also. Too bad they aren't all that easy. So I say Volpes Volpes, and you probably are like, what? What does that mean? If you knew the Latin or um, and many times uh, Latin-based languages like Spanish or Portuguese, um, Italian, you can guess. Volpes Volpes is a fox. But, yeah, our common name is different for that one. Uh, so notice that there is a difference at this ninth position for the fox that's different than the human and the gorilla. So we assume that somewhere in the, in the ancient history, since they diverged from a common mammalian ancestor, that there's been a mutation there that has uh, made the fox sequence different from the human and gorilla sequence. And as you might expect, based on what you know about relationships of these organisms, the human and the gorilla insulin are very, very similar. In fact, I think over this stretch, there's only one nucleotide difference, and it doesn't result in any, base, in any amino acid differences. Whereas the fox, notice there's quite a bit of change in differences, particularly in this region. And in later regions downstream, there's even more that correspond to more amino acid differences. So we can now begin to get an idea by looking at and aligning these homologous genes. We'll talk about homology in great detail later. But by aligning them together, we can get an idea of where mutations have, have occurred and maybe even begin to estimate things like mutation rate. How often do point mutations result in a substitution? How often do they result in an insertion deletion, which we don't have any examples of in this one? Right? And then what does that lead to at the phenotypic level? And we can begin to analyze that. So here we have the, the nucle nucleotides, and here we have the resulting uh, amino acids. Now notice, I've, I've actually started the translation a little bit farther down. I don't have the first methionine in here. Um, I think it's only the first one's missing. But anyway, um, so we can begin to quantify and analyze the genetic diversity, and we're going to be looking at many ways that we do that and, and, and their utility in biology throughout the rest of this semester. Some vocabulary words that you need to know. Locus is, as you might guess from the lat Latin, location in English has the same root word, but it refers to a address or a place on a chromosome. It might refer to a place where a gene is or a regulatory region or where the centromere is or something. But it's just a general location, and so sometimes we'll use it as a very general term for denoting a place on a chromosome. Polymorphism refers to genetic diversity at the DNA level. So that is a polymorphism. However, it does not result in any change. I think it corresponds to this third amino acid. And notice that they're all tryptophan, abbreviated with a W. And so despite having a difference here, no, that's not tryptophan because tryptophan only has one codon. But anyway, it maybe is uh, one of the other ones. Maybe it's one of these ones later on. But that does not result in any uh, uh, difference at the amino acid level, but it, we can still measure it at the nucleotide level. And so that is a polymorphism. And so we're very interested in polymorphisms because they tell us about the history of the organism, and they may result in differences between the organism, although they don't necessarily do that. Okay. So notice many polymorphisms down here. There's even one polymorphism between the gorilla and the chimpanzee, but we can measure those and begin to analyze them. A subcategory of polymorphism, a particular type of polymorphism, is called an allele. And oftentimes alleles are made up of many polymorphisms. But an allele is a variant of a gene. Sometimes people use the term allele when what they, what, I'm sorry, more often they use the term gene when what they really mean is allele. So for example, all humans, barring some sort of large mutation, have the same genes. Right? You have the same genes I do. However, you have different alleles. So your hair might be a different color, or you might be a different height, or you might be any one of a number of different blood type any one of a number of different genetically determined traits because you have different alleles, although you have the same genes that I do. Okay? So an allele is simply a polymorphism or a group of polymorphisms that lead to some sort of phenotypic difference for that gene. Genetic markers are useful polymorphisms, and they can be alleles or not, but any polymorphism that allows us to measure and work with the diversity of an organism. So notice that there are no genetic markers in the gorilla and the chimpanzee, or the human and the gorilla until we have here, and then we have a genetic marker that might tell us something about the history. We could also look at genetic markers within a population. So we might sequence the genes for 100 different humans, 
and find areas where there is variability in it. In fact, these genetic markers are the ones that are used when you are uh, take a DNA swab and look at um, you know what your relatives are or what diseases you might be prone to. They they identify those using those genetic markers. The most common genetic markers we have are SNPs, which is an uh, acronym for single nucleotide polymorphism. Right? It's basically a ancient substitution that resulted in variation in a population that then got passed down to different offspring. But there are other ones, including microsatellites. We won't go into all of them. You don't need to know them. But a microsatellite is one where we have usually tandem or triad repeats over and over and over again, and they can be some of the fastest evolving portions of the DNA. Usually microsatellites have no phenotypic impact, but they can and are often used as good markers for uh, the evolution of populations. And because they evolve rather rapidly, they're very useful for recent uh, divergence of lineages. Okay, so be familiar with all of those vocabulary words.